Welcome into the KSO Sunday show. I am Mason Voth, joined by KSU underscore fan and Drew Galloway as we get set for uh, our first full-blown basketball show of the year. Football, for the most part, is in the rearview mirror, unless Drew wants to tell us that K-State's getting a 1,000 wide receivers in the transfer portal right now. He can do that. We would take that. Uh, but the main emphasis of today will be discussing the basketball team, which has been a roller coaster this year. It has been up and down. I I described them as being like uh, chicken the other day, uh, very volatile meat. You, you never know what you're going to get. You leave it out too long, it's really going to kill you, like literally going to kill you. Uh, but sometimes it's still amazing. And that's kind of what K-State basketball is right now. There are moments where it feels like it is going to kill you. Even when things are going good, it feels that way. But yesterday, we saw a pretty significant flash like we did in the LSU game, like we did in the Villanova game, um, and maybe just a handful of other times throughout the season. This team does have pieces, and they can make things happen, and they can be a real basketball team. This is not just, you know, some, like, scrub unit that they throw out there. Like, there are guys on this team that can make things happen. It's just about the frequency in which that does occur and how consistent they can be moving forward. So, Big 12 play has started, and a lot of the talk going into it was maybe this team has a tough time motivating themselves, or you go out there against whoever, and it's a Sunday afternoon, and it's just a lazy game against a non-con opponent. It's not going to hit the same. So maybe Big 12 play will gas these guys up. It certainly seemed to work yesterday. They went out and took care of business from the jump against UCF, took down the Knights, and Tyler Perry is the major star of the show against UCF. I thought the the best indicator of what was going to happen in that game was he came out, he knocks down the first shot, and it was he caught it, he just shot it. There was no thinking, just let it go. There was confidence in how he played. And he started the second half by passing up a wide-open look from three that was that part of the, the cold chicken that's been left out too long that's going to kill you. I was losing my mind watching that play unfold. I'm like, this is exactly what the problem with Tyler Perry is right now. but. Either he recognized that he screwed up in that process or one of the coaches or maybe even a teammate got into his head and made it clear, like, take that shot. We need that shot from you. And he came out and then immediately nailed like five in a row and got extremely hot from deep, finishes with 25, six of 11 from three, uh, at one point was six of eight, and uh, a really strong game for him. The breakout that K-State needed, they also got, you know, good scoring from Arthur Kaluma, pretty steady, 14 and six. Uh, it wasn't the most efficient shooting the ball, but he still got the scoring done. And then David Gasson had 14 rebounds in the game. And David Gasson is going to be a maddening player for a lot of people. He still is for me. He's going to just do some things that you flat out don't understand how a guy that's played that much basketball can still do. There is still a lot of good that he does, and he's doing it now, specifically rebounding the basketball. You're just going to have to take some of the bad and – the incompetence that will come with his offensive game every once in a while. He, he and Will McNair both have flashed more this year than I would have expected from them, but they still have stretches where they're just like any big man handling the basketball. If they do it too much, they're going to do a lot of things that frustrate you and cause some problems. So those are probably the biggest highlights from yesterday's game. K-State takes down UCF 77-52. to 52. Uh, I'll start with Drew on this one because this is really the crux of – K-State basketball right now. What is real from the U the UCF win yesterday? Like, yeah, they won. Yeah, they kicked their butt. Yes, they this the version that played yesterday looked like an NCAA tournament team. How much of what happened against UCF is going to be able to translate to a majority of the 17 games that are left in conference play as opposed to this being just an outlier, kind of like the LSU game was starting to appear on the schedule where you're a lot more like the team that has screwed around with Wichita State and North Alabama and Oral Roberts and Chicago State and that lost at home by 16 to Nebraska and didn't score it versus this team that was so dominant against UCF and LSU who are not great teams by any means, but they are power competition and you handled them from the jump, took care of your business. So what is real from the, the UCF win and what is out there that you need to see more of? I mean, I think that there's two kind of big picture, like what is real – kind of things that I can that I took away from the game yesterday. I think the first one is that when K State's at their best, their ceiling is very high. I mean, we've we've all kind of hit on it. Like it's been a bit of a roller coaster. 
but the ceiling is very high and like the, the ceiling is probably more towards the Villanova game as opposed to this game where you play pretty well against a pretty good team and you end up winning the game. Uh, but then I think my second, like what is real of the game is that UCF is real bad. Like that's a team that's going to struggle to win big 12 games. And their, their record was probably a, a bit of a mirage based on who they played. And, and I think their next five games, they all play teams ranked in the top 20. So that, that's probably an 0-5 start for UCF. So, I mean, it, it, it's good to see that they came out with intensity and played with a lot of energy. And I think the thing that I, I guess a third thing that I would say is real and a fan and DY have pointed this out, and I pointed this out during the game lot or yesterday as well. That's probably the most connected K State has looked one through five defending all season long. And the and the defense has steadily improved. It started out pretty slow, but now it, it's been about this level all season or the last probably like two, three weeks of the season. And we kind of saw it all come together last night. I mean, they made UCF's life a living hell whenever UCF had the ball at a half court set. Yeah, I think Drew picked it up with his third point. I think the defense for K State has been a steady improvement at the end of December, um, or at the beginning of December, is ranked about 60 in Kim Palm defensive efficiency. It's it's cut that in half. It's ranked 32 right now in defensive efficiency. Uh, I think the last eight opponents has held under one point per possession, and the last five opponents has held under 0.3, no, 0.93 points per possession. Uh, this was Central Florida. I agree with Drew. Central Florida is not very good, but this was their worst uh, offensive game of the season. Case they held them under 0.8 points per possession, which is really hard to do. Um, and even if you look at um, K State's stretch of games, um, even though Wichita State's not very good, it was their second worst offensive game this year. Uh, it was Nebraska's worst offensive game this year, LSU's worst offensive game this year. Uh, Villanova is about their fourth or fifth worst offensive game this year. So the defense has really, uh, in the last month or so, picked it up, figured it out, and it's just going to be a matter of does the shooting come along? And that's the thing that we have to look at is, is the offense from the UCF game real. UCF came into that game with the strength of defense, top 30 nationally in Kim Palm. And again, I think that was built off a week's schedule, but K-State had the best offensive game against that defense um, and, and really tore that defense apart early in the game. Um, UCF strength was forcing turnovers. K-State only had 12 um, and and uh, did a pretty good job taking care of the ball, even though it was a fairly low possession game, only 66 possessions. Um, so I think the defense is real. I think the rebounding on both ends is real because we're not a very good defensive rebounding team, but we're a great offensive rebounding team. Uh, and then the last thing that's real is K-State is really good at getting to the free throw line. And we got to the free throw line a bunch yesterday, outscored them by like 15 points or something from the free throw line. Um, and that's a big deal for this K-State team. When you struggle to shoot, you've got to find ways to score. K-State's really good at scoring around the rim and really good at getting points in the free throw line. Uh, but the shooting thing is going to be the thing that really is what we got to watch, I think. Is is the is the offensive rebounding so good because K State uh, is so bad at making shots right now that uh, it's helping the offensive rebounding? Obviously, I mean these are these are numbers adjusted. It's not like if you miss a thousand shots and you grab yeah. fifty rebounds a game on the offensive side, it's like oh yeah, you're a great offensive. Re no, you just suck at shooting. But I, I I mean this more so in like is K State so bad at missing shots that it is leading to easier offensive rebounds where. You know, the, the, as we all know, with basketball, you come not very close to making a shot. There's a chance that you're putting the ball in a better position for a bad or weird bounce for your team to grab it. Like, it, how much of the offensive rebounding is, in some ways, a credit to how bad K State has shot the ball so far? Yeah, it make it makes a difference. That's that's a point uh, of, of definitely that's valid. Um, but you still they're rebounding 38 percent of their misses, which is number 12 nationally right now. Um, so they still got to go get them. Um, I think they've made it a point to be a good offensive rebounding team. Um, we were a pretty good offensive rebounding team last year, and 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 ten came from a system. That's what Baylor did too. Baylor was always a good offensive rebounding team too. So I think it is something that they stress, and uh, they've got certain assignments because um, 
I remember one game when Cam Carter had like seven or eight offensive rebounds early in the year. He made the point that Cam was playing the three, and K State, I think, in general, sends the one and two back to defend, and they're going to send the three, four, and five at the the rim every time on a missed shot. So it does help to miss shots to get off its rebounds. There's no doubt about it. But still, almost rebounding 40% of your misses is pretty good. Is is that something that's sustainable in Big 12 play, then, that philosophy? And obviously, K-State maybe has changed it up a little bit or will adjust it based on who they're playing. But to just say, hey, we're going to send the the two guards back and then the three, four, and five, you're going to go crash the offensive boards. Is that sustainable? Because you will face teams, obviously, with superior talent and it can run a little bit better. I, I would liken it to uh, one of the things that, that Ryan Russillo once said that kind of triggered some thoughts about the NBA for me was like, and I was telling you this after we went to the Magic game, like the reason why you don't crash the glass in the NBA is because the guys are so good at running the floor that – if you are working for an offensive rebound every possession, you're going to get beat the other way for two points more times than you're going to get a benefit from an offensive rebound because you're just going to get cooked. Is that something that will lessen as Big 12 play goes on where K-State will have to put more emphasis in getting more guys back or doing something differently? Or are they good enough and have the, the skilled guys to where they can make it an asset over the next 17 games? I think it's a matter of where you got to pick your poison on who you play. Like TCU is the number one team in the country in fast break points. It's probably not a team you're going to want to go hit the offensive glass real hard against. Otherwise you're going to give up points. Uh, BYU is top 10 in fast break points. So, you know, you got some of those big 12 teams that like to run. Uh, as we know, even though KU is not always a fast break point team, they do take advantage of you if you mess that up. So you have those matchups, but then you have teams that really don't try to run that like to play slow. And those are the teams you really can clash, crash the glass against. Plus, K-State, you know, <laughs> that's where you argue the big lineups. You know, when we have Kaluma, McNair, and Gasson on the floor, you've got three guys that are six, eight or bigger on the court. You're probably going to go get some boards, even though we're tiny on the one and two when you have those three out there. So, And we're not very efficient with those three out there. But I think that does impact our ability to offensive rebound. But, again, I think it's going to depend – on the opponent and, and how much, you know, we saw when we tried to, to, to get in a running match with TCU last year in Fort Worth, that was not a pretty picture. So you got to be careful with that. If, if you want to take those chances, you know, you're always going to give something up. Shooting wise for K-State yesterday, Tyler Perry elevates the three point shooting by going six of 11 himself. The rest of the team was three of 13 from three. Is this, I mean, it's, it's such a weird thing to consider right now for K-State because in the way basketball is played right now, and specifically if you think about what Jerome Tang comes from and kind of how this offense needs to operate, you need to be able to at least continue shooting to make things work and to have the opportunity to get the flow of the offense going in the right way. But this is clearly not a very good shooting team right now. And I they lack shooters in general. I mean, Cam Carter occasionally can do it, but this has always been my gripe with Cam Carter that at the end of the year, you're going to get an average that might be like 33%. It's a true like average, though, for him. He's not going to shoot 33% every game. He's going to go in there, and he is going to some games be like five of eight from three, and he's going to have a string of them where he is one for four, one for five. Like You're not getting much. Uh, I mean, how how big of a problem is this going to be moving forward for K-State? I mean, obviously, Tyler Perry is a nice boost to it, but, I mean, how much concern should we have on how everybody else is shooting and, and how does – I mean, how does K-State work around that moving forward? I'll let you both have a crack at this one, and Drew can take it on first. I mean, I, I think that it's concerning, but if you look around college basketball right now, there, there are a lot of teams that are struggling to shoot the basketball – I mean, uh, TCU hasn't shot particularly well, except for randomly uh, yesterday afternoon. Uh, KU doesn't have like big time sharpshooters that you're really like necessarily afraid of outside of Kevin McCullough right now. Like it, you just look around and it, the way that it, college basketball right now is so different from the NBA in the sense where college basketball, if a team has like two good shooters, they're probably more of a good shooting team where like the NBA, everybody can shoot. So I'm not like overly concerned. They're also still getting really good shots. I mean, I, 
Dorian Finister had one that was wide open and went in and out. And uh, Arthur Kaluma had, I think, one that was pretty close to going into. Like, they're... The shots are looking good, and what I've noticed too is like the form of some of these shots have gotten a lot better. I I don't know if uh, you guys have noticed, but Arthur Kluma's shot looks a lot different now than it did at the beginning of the year. It looks a lot more smooth and crisp. So I'm not like overly concerned, but it, I mean it, it's something where it takes one bad shooting night, like for all college basketball teams, and it's probably going to be a loss. Yeah, it's, and it's really about the big three in the shooting because those guys are shooting over 19 threes a game between Perry, Kaluma, and Carter. Uh, Carter, you know, probably right now, he's doing a lot of really good things on offense. He's really our best defender on the perimeter, uh, but he's shooting 29% from three and shooting almost seven a game. So that really drops your percentage. But the, the, the big three combined to, to make 32%. The rest of the team is making 25%. So um, the only guy that looks like maybe could be a good shooter is, is RJ Jones, but he hasn't played lately. He is 36% on the season, but is he going to get out the doghouse and is he going to get a chance to, to play at all? So uh, that's a big factor. Um, I think this team does need to shoot 33, 35% from three night in night out to be a NCAA tournament team and be a top half of the Big 12 team. Um, and that's going to be my biggest question going forward There's, is can they do that? Can they make those shots? But it's going to be about Carter. Can Carter be a 31 32% shooter? They probably need Kaluma to stay at the 35% he's at, at nearly four per game. And then the key is going to be Tyler Perry. Um, can he be a 35 to 38% three-point shooter and, and show what he's done in his career? Or is he going to sit all around the lower 30s like he's been so far for K-State. He upped himself to 33% with that 6 of 11 night last night. So we'll see what that what happens with that. Um, but that's the offense on the offensive side of the ball. you got to make threes, um, especially because we generate plenty of open ones. And are we going to be able to do that? Well, so Tyler Perry, we were going to talk about Tyler Perry one way or another today, uh, whether he had the massive night last night or not. But this kind of goes into the the overarching topic of conversation about the win against UCF. I mean, it, should we seriously take this as this is the break breakout and bounce back game for Tyler Perry shooting? And and is North Texas Tyler Perry going to be in a K State uniform the rest of the time where that shooting is is the real thing? Because look, I, I would suggest that Tyler Perry has played enough games in college basketball to where we can look at it and say, okay. He shot 41% on six attempts a game his first year at North Texas. He shot 41% on almost eight attempts last year at North Texas. He's only taken a, a shot more a game, basically. He's taking, I guess he's getting close to nine this year. But he's getting close to nine up a game. Now it's up to 33%. Like History would suggest that he really is a much better shooter than what K-State has gotten out of him. And I mean, I think it was earlier in the year we were talking about, and Fan, you said you think it's just a confidence thing. I mean, I fully believe that's what it is. Last night certainly seemed like a guy that did not lack any confidence. And even after that first one, he was still reluctant. It still looked like there was some lingering effects in the first half, but something triggered there late in the second half after 1745 is when he passed up that open look and then he didn't pass up another one the rest of the game. Uh, so are, would you both bank on Tyler Perry giving you this kind of shooting moving forward? Obviously, I'm not telling you to say, hey, he's going to score 25 every game and <laughs> knock down six every time out um, and shoot, you know, over 50 percent. But are we going to see a Tyler Perry that shoots to the number you're talking about anywhere between 35 and 38 percent over the course of conference play? I mean, I, I would probably say yes, because it looked like his confidence was back. It looked like it. I don't mean this as like a shot to Tyler Perry, like how he was acting before. Well, but... maybe maybe you should mean it that way, and maybe he'll play better then. So, <laughs> but however, like it, however he wants to take it, take it this way, Tyler. But like it, it looked like he was having a lot more fun on the court in the second half because he, he wasn't thinking; he was just shooting, and the ball was going in. Like it, there are times where, like, and Jerome Tank said it after the game, where he wants to be and showcase how to be a true point guard but he know he has to know that his superpower <laughs> is his ability to shoot the basketball and if he has an ounce of space i want him to let it fly every single time because he is the best shooter on this team 
And like, like I've kind of said with some of the other guys, his shot though, looks like it's going in every single time he shoots the ball. So he needs to be the mm-hmm. one that shoots every time if he has an ounce of space. Yeah. And it, it's encouraging because um, I, I counted it up. This was only the fifth time he's made six or more threes in a game. So, uh, and that's in two and a half, basically two and a half seasons playing division one basketball. So that's what 70 to 80 games that he's played so far. So that's significant. And, and 25 points is his third best scoring night in his career as well. And he's he scored 25 points two other times as well. So um, you would hope that that's something that can un- unlock some confidence. Um, I would also think that um, the pure five out offense is probably not what we're going to see all the time in Big 12 play, especially without Glover and Tomlin in the lineup, because I think that was a big part of running that offense. And now hopefully we see a few more sets to get him shots, like because we've seen uh, this this uh, staff run sets last year a lot and generate good shots for players out of those sets. So you can do that. You know, we know that they love to run a lob against the zone because they do it almost every time and get a dunk for Cam Carter. Mm-hmm. So now you have some other options of of what can you do to get Tyler Perry three to four, five shots off a set a game, and then he's going to shoot three or four more off a dribble. He definitely needs to shoot nine to 10 threes a game though. I mean, that's gotta be the minimum. And uh, they've got to, sometimes they've got to be guarded shots, but hopefully the confidence is is a little bit there. Um, and we'll see going forward what that looks like. Uh, real quick on Arthur Kaluma. I, I mean, what what should we be seeing more from him offensively? Where, where should he be getting uh, like a breakdown of his shots from? Because He's been a, a, a fairly good three-point shooter for him this year um, and now small sample sizes compared to a guy like Tyler Perry. But if you look at what he's gone out and done, I mean, he's shot 35% from three. He only took three last night. He made one of them. Does he need to be taking more from there? And, and obviously it wasn't, you know, he missed six of his nine shots last night. So where where should Arthur Kaluma be working more? And how much of that should he be initiating himself versus – being set up by other guys because I think we have seen him at times this year, like against Villanova and LSU, that it, 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 he might need to be a little bit more assertive when he has the ball in his hands and creating something for himself. I think the one area where we see him do it consistently, oddly enough, is he will sometimes he'll he'll do one thing to try and get some space beyond the three point line, and then he almost feels like he has to shoot the basketball, uh, and, and so he'll take some bad ones from three occasionally, but. Where do we think Arthur Kaluma is best suited working forward? Because, I mean, obviously last night there's not a lot to complain about, and we can say that's probably the best that you got out of K-State. But there's a chance that Arthur Kaluma probably still needs to be this team's best player and for sure, you know, their their most consistent scorer. So what's the best way for that to be achieved? I'll, I'll say the first part for Fan because I know that he's going to say it and I want to I want to beat him on saying it. <laughs> every shot for Arthur Kaluma and, this, and for every single player at K-State needs to be a three-pointer or at the rim. No two-point jumpers. <laughs> um, but that, that's just – it's the most analytical thing because two-point jumpers are very inefficient. K-State's also not very good at them right now. I don't like that one of the sets that they ran uh, in the game yesterday was for an Arthur Kaluma mid-range jump shot. That that bothered me a little bit. Uh, but, I mean, I, there's a point where he probably needs to be more aggressive. And, and with how he's shooting from three, it, like, it's just, again, like the small step where I would like him to get to a point where if he even has an ounce of space, let it fly. I'd rather I'd much rather have him shoot a three that's probably halfway guarded then have him pump fake and then take a mid-range jump shot, which is what we've kind of been seeing from him. Yeah. Just, just looking at his shot chart, Drew mentioned the shot they took for, got him for him yesterday, which was like toward the right side of the lane from near the free throw line. He is one of 11 on that shot this season. He has made uh, one, two, he's made nine two point jump shots this season. So Drew is absolutely right. Quit shooting two-point jump shots, especially tough ones, especially when you pump fake from three and then go inside and shoot a hard shot. Um, from the left wing and from the top of the key, 
he is making over 40% from three behind the arc. So that would be the, the shot you want to get for him, even from the left corner, he's 30%. So those are the shots you want to get, and he's 71% at the rim. So it, when he gets to the rim, the problem is he really has to go one direction. And even if he is going to his left around the rim, he's going to scoop it back yeah. with his right hand. Uh, and he still makes a lot of those shots. Um, but I think Drew is right. If you got an open three, he's got to shoot it. And they've got to generate shots from what I'm looking at from the left wing uh, for his best opportunities or from the top of the key. So that would be my thing. He, he likes to drive it. I think he wants to prove he's a driver. And I think he wants to prove he can make those two-point shots because that's probably an NBA thing. Um, but we, he needs to prove that he can help K-State win. And right now, helping yeah. K-State win is get to the rim and make threes. Well, and I would also say uh, that the NBA doesn't care if you can make those two-point jump shots if you can't do the stuff at the rim and be on the yeah. three-point line. Uh, that stuff comes first before the other stuff, which you know makes you a, a much more valuable asset. All right. Uh, a couple, one other thing offensively, if you can't tell, like has been reiterated already, but everybody offensively on this team is a lost cause unless you are one of the three top scorers on this team. I, I, I really firmly believe that right now. Uh, so let's, let's dissect Cam Carter a little bit because uh, look, Cam Carter has been a pretty consistent in terms of scoring output. Um, you know, five, I'm, I'm not going to complain about a five of 12 night and two of six for three from Cam Carter, uh, if he's going to give you 12 points. And also, I mean, he was good in a lot of areas last night. He had six assists as well, three blocks for Cam Carter. So, uh, he's, he's been really good. Um, where, where should we expect Cam Carter to be the rest of the season? Cause I think there were flashes early this year where it was like, okay, there's been a pretty big step forward for Cam, but now we're. He's definitely elevated his floor from last season, which is a good thing. Um, what is the expectation for Cam Carter moving forward? And really, I guess the point of all this is just kind of putting together a a big synopsis of are the main three guys for K State possible uh, out like possible candidates to become a big three or a significant three? I know that the scoring numbers right now would suggest that they are in the Big Twelve. But obviously, for what this team needs, you need more than just you know a scoring average at the end of the year. You need production and efficiency, and can they do it? So what what's the the book on Cam Carter, and what uh, should be the expectation moving forward there? I mean, you probably want last night to be his floor in conference play, uh, just just point wise. E efficiency, you probably want more of that, but we kind of. It's a hit and miss with efficiency with Cam Carter sometimes. But the, the one area where I'm probably the most concerned with Cam Carter actually comes on the defensive end because he's their best defender and always guards the other team's best player. I, I worry about him tiring out during games, and I think that that's why you've kind of seen him in the second half falter off a little bit and not be as efficient in the second halves of games. It's like... A, I would want him to be around like that 12 points be his floor, but I also don't want him to sacrifice any of his defense because I, I think that he's by far the best defender on this team. Yeah, I would agree. How, how do you balance that? The the workload he's going to have on the defensive end guarding usually the best team, the other team's best perimeter player night in and night out and still score. Um, like Kaluma, he's really good at the rim. He's 74% at the rim. Like Kaluma, he's best at the left wing. He's hitting 40% from three at the left wing spot. So, you know, getting him those shots, generating those shots. Like Kaluma, he likes to shoot way too many two-point jump shots and is not very good at it. So um, we got kind of two guys, even though they're different sizes in a two and a three or two and a four, uh, that kind of have the same problem um, as far as where they're scoring from and how they score. So continuing to see him attack is nice. Um, because he's been a much more aggressive player. Uh, but I agree with Drew. He's a 1.04 efficiency for the season. You'd like to see that. He's probably, because of his usage and the tough shots he takes and the fatigue from defense, he's probably not going to be like a 1.15 efficiency guy. But he can be a, in the upper 1.08, 1.09 and help this team. And I think that's what we need to look for is, is maybe reduce some of those tough two-point shots, uh, continue to get to the rim, and 
find those spots on the floor where they can make th- where he's making threes. And right now for him, it's the left wing and maybe the right corner where he's hitting 37.5 percent. So those are things that I look for. Um, they definitely need these three to be the big three. Um, right now, they're averaging 47 points per game between the three of them, which would be the 11th highest total in K-State history for a top three scoring trio. Um, and this, it'd be the first time ever with three guys at 15 points per game or more, which is where they're all at right now. So if they can maintain that, um, that's good good for K-State basketball, but it's got to be an efficient one point or 15 points per game from all of them and not a low efficiency, taking a bunch of shots and, and missing too many hard shots. Is it, Deb, this, team, this, oh, team's love, this team's love affair with two point jump shots is genuinely wild. Now, the good thing is, Drew, the the rate is not high. It's like <laughs> three hundred in the country. So we don't. We maybe it's because I harp on it so much that we think about it. But <laughs> they actually, the two point jump shot rate is not super high, which is good. They're just really, really bad at it. They're just really bad. Um, they, they're like 360 in the country on two-point jumpers. Yeah, yeah. Percentage. It's bad. It's, yeah, you know. Uh, I was I was going to use a, an analogy that, well, I mean, a lot of people probably would have laughed at it, and but I, I don't think that it's necessarily appropriate. So I'm, I'm going to try and workshop in my head real quick on the fly something that's a little bit uh, – <laughs> not I, not as, like, intense as what I was going to say. Um Mm, I'm trying to like, what is? I, I'm very intrigued of what the original <laughs> yeah, version of it is. Well, I, I just, I, it's not like it's not. It wasn't going to be offensive to anybody because I mean, I was going to use a, a, an example that was like just downright appalling to everybody, so nobody was going to. Uh, <laughs> and I, but I don't want to put this on like, yeah, you guys are shooting two point jump shots. I'm going to compare you to to, uh, to these type of people. But I, I guess I would I would liken it to, um, I'll, well here I'll use I'll use my well no that's not even fair because I I'm, I'm not a bad brother, uh <laughs> I, let's uh yeah, ten more seconds and and I'll decide if I want to say it or we'll just move on. Um, I would liken it to okay so. Yeah, I'm just going to say it because I it, it, it's all right. If people are mad at me for saying this, for, you know, taking a stand, whatever, uh, it it would be like somebody that, you know, like you've got, uh, no, I still don't know that I want to say it. So I, probably, <laughs> I really probably shouldn't. So uh, I'm sorry for not paying off on, on that to everybody. Sorry, sorry. I think for, you know, 80% of the people, they would have been like, yeah, I get that. Uh, 20% would have been like, that's a, that's a little much, so. Uh, I'll just share it with Fan and Drew afterwards. You'll probably have to remind me about it. Uh, but it's 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 an, a comparison that I now fully uh, believe in. All right. Uh, one of the things that Drew mentioned there was the depth. And not only is it a significant thing for K-State, uh, it became a much more significant topic during last night's game when you're crushing UCF by 1,000 and Jerome Tang still is like, I, I don't want to play anybody else in this game. Um I mean, there's a lot of things that we can can kind of go over it with, but my big point would be, and I talked about this in the instant reaction video last night, the depth thing is probably the biggest problem that you suffered from losing Quez Glover and Naquan Tomlin for various reasons, in that um, this team in non-conference play, for the most part, they were playing so bad and so disappointing that I wasn't even going to entertain how Quez Glover and Aquan Tomlin would have impacted this team in one way or the other. Um, just because, number one, they, they it's not like they were known commodities. We're just banking on something different happening. And now with Naquan Tomlin, a lot of people have a lot of confirmation there because he's come out in two of his three games with Memphis. He's played really well and been really good. Um, but, you know, I still would have had questions about how consistent he could have done it for K-State and given them truly what they needed. But nonetheless, we do know that Naquan Tomlin would have helped this team to have another competent body out there offensively and can do some things. Quez Glover, we know that this team operates better when Day-Day Ames is on the floor, but it's not because of Day-Day Ames. It's a stylistic thing, and Day-Day Ames is an 18-year-old freshman that plays like it a lot and isn't good enough right now to be on the floor for extended minutes. And I think that's one of the major things that Jerome Tang is having to wrestle with right now. We've said it multiple times, but like Jerome Tang – has to see the numbers and has to understand I'm better when we have another guard out on the floor. But 
there's also the whole side of him that goes, I cannot play this kid for more than five minutes at a time or he's going to make some monumental errors for us. So it's really tough for K-State right now. What what should we make of how Jerome Tang handled last night with only playing seven guys until it was truly, you know, at the very end of the game and he had no choice but to play uh, everybody else? Like, and what would you do differently? Like, you don't have to be critical of Jerome Tang, although that it's it's fair to be in this circumstance. But what would you do differently? Because uh, even if you think that, hey, the seven guys got the job done last night, whatever, I don't think it's a good business decision in a game where you're kicking somebody's butt by for, by 30 points the entire time at home when you're about to start this gruesome stretch of conference play to just keep playing these guys and work them to the ground. When you can get them a rest, find a way to get them a rest, and Jerome Tang did not do that last night. I, I guess I, I'm the opposite because K-State hadn't been playing well up until last night. And with how the net and Ken Palm works, like it really skews your way if you just absolutely run a team out of the gym. And K State was up 34 at one point. I think it actually got up to 35 at one point. And if they would have beat UCF probably by like 40, then the Ken Palm jump that was 18 points at the end of the game last night probably could have been like 25 or 30. So with how the advanced metrics work, I think I would like to see, I don't want to say a running up the score, but I mean, you've seen other teams do this, like BYU, who has less quad one and quad two wins than K-State does, but are number four in the, or were number four in the net going into last night because they'd been running out or running teams out of the gym. Which we'll get to them, but that was the most predictable fraud of all time. So <laughs> yeah. I, did, I did not think that they would prove it game one against Cincinnati at home, but I'm glad they did. So, like, you see that with, like, other teams. So, like, I, I get wanting to see other guys and, like, see what you have. And ideally, you'd have an eighth person that you trust. But last night, with how everything's kind of played out with the net and with Ken Palm so far... It's pro- it probably was better for K State to keep the starters in in the seven guys that they played in as long as they did because it, it gave them such a big jump. Yeah, I I see that. I, I think the the net jump was nice, uh, but I do think winning takes care of that. Even if even if they're close games from now on, if you're winning games in the Big Twelve and you get to nine, ten, eleven Big Twelve wins, you're going to be fine with your quad wins and your net's going to be. 30s, 40s, which is what you need to get to. Um, so, so I, I see that point. Um, it is interesting. Like I, I think you know the old adage as a coach is the the biggest message you can send is by playing time or not playing time. And I don't know if that's the case. It seems to be the case. I mean, based on the comments after the Chicago State game, with um, talking about those guys, the one word answer Coach Tang gave was mature with some of those guys that haven't been playing, I think specifically Colbert and, and Jones. So something's going on there where he's sending a message. I mean, Colbert, Buddy, Jones, and Taj played two minutes each in that game. They got in the last two minutes of the game. So it was kind of like the walk-ons, and then Tamon Lindsay, the one walk-on, did get in after them for another minute. So um, they're sent. I, it's got to be a trust issue and a focus issue from those guys uh, either on the scouting report or whatever they're doing in practice, um, that he's not willing to play him. And even game to game, that switches. I mean, Manning was our guy, uh, energy guy, and played a decent role against Chicago State and then came in with the other guys at the end of this game. So uh, it does make it tough. I, I do think I, I do think in the, the biggest issue is an injury. I do think you can get worn out, uh, but I think – freshmen get worn out like Danny Ames could get worn out but all these other guys Perry, Gasson, Kaluma, Carter, McNair even those guys have played power conference basketball or high level basketball even though Perry wasn't a power conference guy they've played lots of minutes so I think you can sustain it given the number of breaks in games and and TV timeouts and five four to five days between games um now, the, the tough stretch was when we were going to overtime every game in the middle early in December, and those guys were playing 45 minutes a game. That's tougher. But I, I do think 
34, 35, 36, you can sustain. It's not ideal, but uh, I do think someone else does have to step up for this team to be an NCAA tournament team from those guys that played two minutes in, in that game. Because I think you'd like your your rotation to be eight. Even t- Coach Tank said he'd like it to be eight, ideally. So they're figuring that out. I think they've got to figure that out as a staff, and then the guys have to figure it out if they want to play or not. At, at what point does – I mean – I think the the philosophy and and look, we're not there, so obviously we don't know what goes into it. So maybe there really is like some serious maturity problems that has to be addressed with these guys to even get one of them to where they're able to see the floor. But like, it feels like there's just been it's Jerome Tang has been a little bit oversensitive in how he's decided to hold guys out of playing this year, and it's been no rhyme or reason seemingly, like the Taj Manning thing. How immature did he get from Tuesday night to Saturday night? Like, what did his good 15 minutes in the Chicago State game against a terrible team, did did his ego get so inflated from that? Or, like, what went down there? And, and look, you can – I'm not advocating that we need to see more Taj Manning this entire season. But I just, we've heard this, it seems like, after every other game where this guy needs to mature, this guy needs to mature – and they sit, they sit, and then, oh, there they are for 20 minutes, and then they sit, they sit. Like, it, it's just – it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So, at what point does Jerome Tang need to just trust one of these guys and give them in-game action to try and prove themselves? Or is that even a pointless exercise? Because it seems like Taj Manning did that on Tuesday, and then he never saw the floor last night. So, I mean, what 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 should K-State do here? Because, I mean, I I think at this point, like, your best bet is probably that RJ Jones or Michaela Rich, they can somehow age quick enough to be that eighth guy just from the standpoint of like, they probably have the most talent or at least the most unknown commodity to them. Uh, The others, it seems like at this point, we know Jarrell Colbert is probably never going to get more than five minutes a game at K-State or for a program like this. Taj Manning, good Tuesday night against Chicago State, but they, they're not even in a conference, so I can't even tell you to go play in their conference. You can go <laughs> just follow their schedule around and see if you can get games in against whoever they're like. It seems like it would be those guys. So at what point do you just kind of have to scrap it and say, we got to take a chance and give these guys an opportunity to get out there? And look, last night, probably not the most ideal game because things were going so well, but it does seem like there will come a time where I think you're going to have to get over that some of these guys may not be as mature as you want them to be because you're going to have to rely on them stepping up in a big moment at some point. So how, how should they go about that? Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's a tough question. That's uh, the, the $3 million question where like it, it's one where, I mean, at, at a certain point, like you do need somebody to step up but like i'm also of the opinion of like if you're building a program and building a culture if somebody's not doing something at practice or isn't following the scouting report i wouldn't put them in the game so i it's gonna take something a a switch is gonna have to flip somehow with somebody to be able to be trusted in that sense and like you said like it probably needs to be rj jones or uh, buddy rich and and honestly i'd rather probably have it be rj jones for another guard that can come in but like it, it's it's hard right now and i mean it's it's also like you said that it's not ideal like n- nothing about this season has really necessarily been ideal because you have nate quantum and quez glover you, you don't have this depth problem you actually have probably too many guys that could have had potential to play minutes so, I mean, it, it's tough. I mean, I, I see where Tang is coming from, but they also need to know that, like, they need an eighth player. And I also, I also think it coaches are still figuring out how to do this in the portal era. I mean, three of K-State's top seven guys are brand-new transfers, and then you have a, a freshman. If you go down to their top eight or nine, it's three freshmen, three transfers, and two second-year guys. So – Figuring out the dynamics of how you used to develop a, a, a roster and bring it along and prove points with playing time, et cetera, 
and how you do it now in the portal era with having to trust guys maybe earlier than you want to and, and going back from bad habits you've – not bad habits, but habits you've had as a coach for 20 years uh, for some of these guys, I think they're learning. I think that's part of it too. I think part of it – UCF was a weird lineup. They had five guys that were 6'5 or smaller and five guys that were 6'8 to 6'11 that played. So matchups could be an issue with a guy like Buddy or Taj in that game. So – there's there's a lot of those kind of dynamics. I don't know how they you know how you put together your scouting report, those kinds of things. Uh, but I do think it, it, it's getting to a point. It, it is going to get to a point these first couple weeks of Big Twelve play where you've got to throw some of those guys out there and see how they do, and see if you can trust them. I mean, you know, Tang even in mid last year he had to learn that with Marquise Noel and that he wanted him to play like the point guards he's used to having play. And then he had to figure out, I've got to just let Noel play. And he might have a guy or two on this team right now that he's still figuring that out with. You're probably more likely to give leeway to a, a, a transfer, third, fourth, fifth year guy than you are to a freshman. But sometimes you may have to try that with a freshman and see what happens. So I don't know what it's going to look like, but I do think eight, finding that eighth guy will be a major factor uh, in, in what K-State does in Big 12 play. I don't think seven is sustainable. Because even your seventh guy right now is not very efficient, even though you're better with him on the floor. Daddy Ames is not to be too cruel, but he's putting up Javon Thomas efficiency yeah. numbers right now. Oh yeah. And no, that's we, we need him to be better. Yep. No, it's 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 not great. It is not a, it's not great right now at all. Uh I mean, if it's it's pretty apparent where K State sits right now and how things go. I mean I think another thing that's ideal, not ideal with all of this is, I mean, you go look at the, on Kim Palm, it's always helpful to see the most frequent lineups used. The fact that there's such a significant drop off between the first set of five guys to the second one is pretty telling because that's only changing one guy in the lineup. I mean, they're using the lineup that they start games with Perry, Carter, Kaluma, Gasson, McNair over 26% of the time. The next most used lineup is used 8% of the time, and all that is doing is taking McNair off the floor and putting Day-Day Ames in there. Um, that That's a pretty telling thing and, and just so tough for K-State to navigate. And then like what fans saying there, I mean, you're essentially first guy off the bench right now is a guy that should not, that isn't good enough really to have that role. I mean, let, let's be honest about it right now. And that's not saying that Day-Day Ames sucks, and that's not saying that he won't ever be good enough for it. But when you're – Javon Thomas, you do not use that term lightly. That man was terrible at basketball. That is the worst K-State basketball player that I have ever seen with my own two eyes. I will I, – I have zero love in this world for Javon Thomas. I hope he's doing fine as a human. Uh, I hope he never touches a basketball again because – that would be cruel to the sport of basketball for him to pick up a basketball ever again. And I, it's, it's just, it's not good for K-State yeah, right here, now. Here, here's the context, Mason. K-State going back to 1999 has had five guys that have played at least 15 minutes a game with efficiencies at 0.82 or less. Javon Thomas had two of those. <laughs> the other ones were... Quentin Buchanan, Selt Miguel, <laughs> Luke Kasubke, and Richie Terry. So yeah. that's the company right now he's he's uh, tracking with as far as guys that play a lot and aren't very efficient. I can't believe that Luke Kasubke got <laughs> had a season where he got 15 minutes a game. He did, yeah. The oh. 21 season was not pretty. Amazing. Yeah, I no, I I know it was not pretty. <laughs> I just I, I'm I'm shocked by that that it was that he got that much. Uh, he he'll always have that corner three against Wichita State though. So the year of love, cut. Yeah, so man, that's 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 not good, uh, and also just indicative of uh, so how how careless Bruce was when it came to to offense. Uh, all right, let's move on here. Uh, well, actually, one last thing about depth. I just have one question for the both of you. Two words. Dorian Finister. <laughs> he was legitimately good last night. Like, it, he was playing really good defense. It was kind of like the Taj Manning game against Chicago State where it was like the, the stats probably didn't show, like, how good he was. But I thought that he was solidly the sixth best 
player for K-State last night. Yeah, um, I'll just – the only other guy under .9 efficiency for K-State besides <laughs> besides Day-Day is Dorian Finister at .87. So – and a 7.7 per. Uh, Day-Day's is a 5.1 per. So anytime your per is under 10, it's not good. So, again, not very efficient. He's serving a role right now. I do think – I do think the the size of our guards is a problem. And he's right now the best of the bigger guards we have. So they're kind of, I think, forcing. And he's got some experience. So I think I think it really is a message to other guys like R.J. Jones. And it's being sent. And whether or not that message is accepted or not will probably be the key. So we'll see what happens with it. But I do think, you know, he, Drew's right. He had a good second half. But it's a lot easier to have a good second half when you're up 25. So, yeah, I'll give him credit for playing hard and knowing his role. But I don't think he's the answer. Yeah, I, I think I think some of the the actual box score numbers you can see that was just circumstance of right place, right time last night. Um, there were still a lot more moments in there where you watch him on floor and just go, I don't know about this. Uh, all right, let's uh, let's roll on here. Big 12 play starts. K State one to zero. They now get. I mean, as easy of a road game as you can get outside of playing UCF, which KU gets to do on Wednesday. So good luck to the Knights there. Uh, the, on the road in Morgantown this weekend, look, I, West Virginia, they were really bad to start the year. And then their government said, oh, you know, screw our crappy toll roads and our crappy education <laughs> system and everything else that we have that is just, a giant flaw that makes us look like the butthole of America in West Virginia. <laughs> let's let's fix this transfer problem. By golly, Raekwon Battle needs to be able to play. And Kirk Creesa, you know, yeah, maybe he he took some NIL payments he wasn't allowed to. Let him on the floor. When those guys started playing and they started having guys on the floor, I thought, okay, this team is going to be better than what the record indicates. I did not think they'd get smashed by 30-some last, last night at Houston. They did. They appear to still be a not so good basketball team. Uh, what is the expectation when K State goes to Morgantown? And I mean, given how everything will shake out this year, and I know it's not late in the year, so it, metaphorically speaking, maybe it's not. But in terms of resume and everything else, is this game in Morgantown almost a must win for K State if they want to get enough on their resume to go to the NCAA tournament? It, it it does kind of feel that way. Like th this is like you said, the most gettable road Big Twelve game you're gonna get outside of UCF. And they don't even play at UCF this year, so they that's for K State. Yeah. This is it. So like this is a game where I even said it in a group chat uh, last night. I said this this game on Tuesday is it doesn't matter how it looks. If you get the win, you get out of there and you're happy because you're one and zero on the road in Big Twelve play, and it gives you the chance. And Dy's talked about it. I talked about it last night with him uh, during the game. I said, "You start three and one, four and one in Big Twelve play. You feel like you're really there, and and the chance is there. I mean, it, this is about as soft." as an opening five big 12 games as you probably could have asked for if you're k-state uh, your road games aren't against teams that are world beaters i know texas tech beat texas yesterday but i'm really not sure if texas is that good right now they seem to be really underachieving so th this is as gettable of a road game as you're going to get it the schedule is playing out pretty well west virginia is coming off of getting pummeled since they've got everybody and they all went all crazy to get battle in the lineup, they've also only won one game <laughs> in, in this time True. period. So, I mean, it, this is one where you win, you move on, and you're happy because you won. I mean, it, for for example, uh, Radford went into West Virginia and won earlier this year with when battle was playing, so that this needs to be a win. Yeah, look, I mean, West Virginia is a five and nine team for a reason. All five wins have come at home. Their best win is over Drexel, who is one hundred and eight in Kim Palm. Dragons uh, slayed them. They've also <laughs> lost 
at home to Monmouth. They've lost at home to St. John's and Pitt, who are solid teams. They lost at home to Radford. Uh, they've played some teams close, Ohio State overtime game, uh, one point loss to Radford. Uh, Frank beat them by eight uh, on a neutral site. So it's not a very good team, even with their pieces back. They're a terrible shooting team. They're worse than K-State from three. They're not very good from two. Uh, weirdly, um, Josh Eilert, fellow Osborne County, uh, raised in Osborne County person. So I do I do like and hope and wish him well, but he's in a tough situation. Weirdly, West Virginia is usually known for turning people over like crazy. They're 347th in turnover rate forced this year. So it's a different type of defense than we saw with Bob Huggins. Um, so again, this is – if you want to be a tournament team, you can't lose this game because I don't see West Virginia turning it around kind of like they did last year because they were not very good early last year and turned it around and made the tournament. I don't see that happening this year with with that that roster, that team. I think uh, the the rulings and all that have not done West Virginia any favors with trying to figure out who the, who's playing week to week and who's eligible week to week. Uh, but even if they've after they've gotten everybody back, they're still not very good. So. Uh, it's a team. It's a game. Honestly, you, you should win if you have any hope of being a tournament team like K State wants to be. Yeah, this this is a, a game for K State where um, this is this is a perfect opportunity to go out and I, I I used the phrase last night afterwards. We just need more data points with this K State team now to see what what was last night. Was it another outlier in the course of the season? It seems like as of now, but full body of work. K State has played. Probably three outlier games this year. Um, if you want to be generous, I, I would throw South Dakota State in there probably um, based on how they played in that game. But go out and just win on the road at West Virginia, and I can start to buy in more into how awesome you played against UCF and start to see the light at the end of the tunnel and that this team might be better than what we anticipated. Um, and, and this team is not, not going to be – this team has zero chances being as good as last year's team or even half as good as last year's team. But last year's team wasn't anything special in the non-conference. Uh, shout out to Jess Settles. Uh, he was the only one that saw it in the non-con last year for this team. Uh, but then everybody else is just kind of like, yeah, okay. Then they were a different team in conference play. And that can be the same thing for this team. It just won't be to the same level. Um, but K-State, the opportunity is out there. So uh, here's a look at the, the resume currently for K-State. Because uh, we're going to be tracking it all year. So in the net, they moved up to 77. They're up to 60 in Ken Palm entering today. And there's a breakdown with the quads and the games that are left out there. Uh, quad four, that West Virginia game at home will be a quad four as of now. Probably will stay that way. And Wichita State, they just lost on the road today at Temple. That will probably move into that range as well, I would imagine. Um, and then you're obviously going to have a lot of opportunities for really good wins out there. It's just about how many of them can you get. Um, so what what do we make of where K-State's resume currently stands? And, Fan, you're probably the most equipped to kind of go into this for us. What is that target number of wins that K-State needs to where I don't even want you to give me the number that makes them feel comfortably in. You can start by giving me the number that says, hey, this team at least is going to give themselves a chance with this record on Selection Sunday. Well, it to me, it really comes down to quad one, quad two wins and avoiding quad three, quad four losses. So quad one wins, I'd say you want to get to five minimum. You know, I think K-State has 11 or 12 quad one games left in the Big 12 because the Big 12 is strong. So you're going to have opportunities to get there. Uh, quad two, I think they've got five more games. You probably want to win at least three or four of those. Um, so, so your total, I, I think in the league, you're looking at nine and nine, um, which is going to get you to 20. Uh, I think you're, I think if you're, if you're sitting at eight and 10 in the league, it's going to be tough for K-State, um, depending on the losses and wins. But um, looking at those quad, quad wins is going to be the, the factor. Now, the, my one enc encouragement, uh, one of the metrics I follow all year long is strength of record, which is on ESPN's uh, resume page. Strength of record is, if you look at strength of record over the years, teams that have 
ranked high in strength of record by people who followed it because you have usually been at large teams. Usually that means you got to be top 45 strength of record um, to get in. Right now, K-State's 44 on the ESPN strength of record, which does a decent job of kind of looking at where you play. It's not quite like the RPI was. Uh, I think it factors in some other things. And that they would actually right now, they put K-State as 11 seed based on that uh, strength of record, uh, which is <clears throat> in the Big 12 second to last getting in. They have BYU as the 47th strength of record team and a 12 seed. So um, they have eight teams from the Big 12 in based on their strength of record formula right now. Teams that are out uh, that you would think would be in right now would be BYU is barely in. Iowa State is out, even though they have really good metrics. TCU and Texas are just out. So I think that's something to look at. <clears throat> but again, that's so fluid. Right now, it's going to be so fluid as we start Big 12 play and get into those first five or six games of Big 12 play. Teams are going to move up and down on that thing a lot. Just because you, now you're stacking quality games, quad one and quad two games that you really didn't do in the non-conference, even if you played a tough non-conference. So I think, you know, again, five quad one wins. <coughs> We're at three quad two wins right now. It's likely to stay, uh, you know, with, with injury to Providence is uh, Harper, right? He's out. So that really hurts their chances of being a good team. I think Villanova is probably going to be a tournament team. Um, so I think that's going to maybe move back into quad one win. Uh, but in total, you, you I always look at quad one and quad two combined, and you want to get to 10 combined in that, those two categories to be safe. So K-State has the schedule to do that just because the Big 12 is the toughest schedule in the country still, even with a couple bad teams like West Virginia and UCF. Um, so that would be, that'd be my thing to track. Get those five quad one wins, probably get two or three, four more quad two wins and avoid that quad four loss, which is really <laughs> West Virginia at home is, is the only quad four opportunity left unless another team slips a lot. Yeah. I mean, uh, fan just kind of hit it, everything on the head there. Uh, I'm, I'll, I'll add in that. The the one real kind of killer in all this, and it, and it just sucks because at the time you thought that that was probably going to be a, a better loss. But man, that UC that USC oh, loss yeah. right now is not looking good. No, those guys. Uh, Fan and I talked about this uh, on our way back from Orlando. We we were trying to make sense of it, but I really do think that is the case of they they benefited from like that being the very first game of the year. And now you've gotten to a point in the season where you have guys that's like, well, that's my ball. Like I should be the one trying to score 20 a game. Uh, and unfortunately there is only one basketball and you got to find a way to work as a team. And, and we see this a lot. I mean, these, the, the whole one and done thing, it's still a significant deal in college basketball, but the one and done type of player has shifted away from being on the teams that actually win at a pretty high level. Um, and the ones that do still show up, I mean, that that's typically a down year for that team. Like Andy Enfield has been successful recently at USC. Like it's not just the fact that, Hey, he showed up from Florida Gulf coast and he's been there a while and he's been treading water. Like a lot of PAC 12 coaches seem to be able to do like he's had a good program, but he dipped his toes into this water and it's, it's not going very well for him. And I think we're seeing that. I mean, I, people were trying to talk about like, well, why is, you know, college basketball so different now and all this. And I, I would talk about go and look at like the last set of like high end NBA draft picks. Like look at where like f number one and number two overall picks are coming from. Like Anthony Edwards was at Georgia. How does that make any sense in the world? You know, like that we're just seeing the way that these guys get distributed and how it works out now is a, is a little bit of a different thing and a big deal. So I think, there, as time has gone on, that team is just going to struggle to get things figured out, and maybe the talent eventually comes through. Um, it's not like they play in the toughest conference in the world, so they could get hot and win a bunch of games, but it doesn't seem likely right now. That That is probably one of the more disappointing things. Um, and Miami hasn't been horrible, but they now have three losses, and you feel like you may have gotten them on just a, a really awesome shooting night, which they're capable of. And K-State, you know, outside of about five to ten minutes in that game, they played well themselves. So uh, we'll see how it goes. I I think that obviously you have to win in Morgantown. I mean, 
what are the prospects that this team can win in Lubbock then on Saturday? Because Texas Tech, uh, all of a sudden, I mean, that uh, I wasn't sure what to think they'd be with McCaslin. I thought that they would be competitive this year. I just didn't know that they would have enough. But you're getting more than Joe Toussaint has ever given in his career. Um, Pop Isaacs might be in trouble with the law, might have done some things morally wrong. Who knows? But Grant McCaslin, Texas Tech, they do not care. Put Pop Isaacs on the floor uh, and let him go. <laughs> Uh, I mean, is it possible that we're talking about K-State being 3-0 in conference play uh, next Sunday? I mean, I think I think that it's possible. I mean, if if you're going to win road games in this league, looking at K-State's schedule, like outside of probably BYU and Cincinnati, like these are the two that like you probably feel the best about. So, I mean, it, it's definitely possible. I mean, Texas Tech is a solid team and just beat Texas. But, I mean, they, they kind of have the same issues that K-State's had of, like, you don't really know what they have right now. Yeah, I I, I don't know what to make of them. I, I do think going to Austin and winning is is significant. But, I, I like we talked about earlier, I'm not sure how good Texas is. Other than that, um, their best win is – Michigan, maybe. Michigan's yeah. a train wreck this year. They beat Northern Iowa at a neutral site. So uh, at home, they've played mostly bad teams. They beat Oral Roberts by six at home. And they got uh, smoked by Villanova. Uh, well, okay. By Villanova. Guys, I was told Oral Roberts was pretty good when I was hitting alarm bells after that overtime win. So, well, I, uh, I think, come on. I just think I think Oral Roberts might still be good enough to win the Summit. I'm not saying they're a great team. The Summit's kind of up between them, South Dakota State, and St. John or some other team up or St. Thomas. Oh, St. Thomas, yeah, yeah, St. Yeah. Thomas. So, so those three are kind of the teams to beat in the Summit. Still, um, I did think Oral Roberts looked a lot better than South Dakota State, even though I think South Dakota State's probably the better team right now. So. Um, Regardless, I don't know what to make of Texas Tech. I do think um, it would be interesting to see how Tyler Perry reacts to this game. And, you know, you, you could get a really – either a really great game from him or you could get an awful game from him in that situation, in that setting, and playing his old coach. So that will be uh, the thing to watch for me in that game. Um, they're playing super slow. They've got a really good defense. And then surprisingly, they're playing pretty good offense. But again, I think a lot of their offensive numbers are inflated by a pretty uh, pretty soft non-conference schedule. All right. Well, let's uh, close things out. Let's talk about the rest of the Big 12 yesterday. First full day of play and everything that worked out uh, with it, KU and TCU. I mean, no better way to start Big 12 play than a classic Big 12 game in Allen Fieldhouse. Uh, just, you know, got to help the Hawks out a little bit. Uh, and I want KU fans to know this, like <laughs> just own up to it and embrace it. Like you don't have to be so soft and sensitive. Like it's pretty simple to explain why you get all of these calls. You are one of the five best basketball programs of all time. You are amazing every single year. You have one of the best coaches that this game has ever seen. And he does not care about consequences. Neither does his, you know, slimy assistant coach Curtis Townsend <laughs> and you are you are the king of this league like that is why you get calls it you get them you don't have to, it's not offensive to say that you get them and that's not what people are doing and you're just the common enemy and it you absolutely get these calls own up to it embrace it I think what I said on Twitter yesterday was you are kings everyone else is peasants act like it do not get up in your feelings when people say that, yeah, you might have gotten some calls that are monumental and helping you win a, a game here or there. Nobody is saying that you win all nine home games every year in conference play because of the refs. You just, the one or two that you might lose, you get some extra help in a key moment. Like, it's fine. Just own up to it. It's totally fine. So a perfect way to start Big 12 play in Lawrence. Uh, and then Houston blasted West Virginia. Uh, to tell us that Houston's at least going to try and take on Kansas in year one. We'll see uh, what the the Houston play is like after 18 games in Big 12 play instead of just one. Baylor survived in overtime against Oklahoma State. Baylor has been shooting it amazing all year. They did not against Oklahoma State. They just kept taking three after three and missing it. So 
uh, my kind of basketball right there. I respect the resiliency <laughs> that they showed uh, in trying to go out there and shoot the lights out, even though they <laughs> were not going to. Iowa State lost on the road at Oklahoma, who is a uh, candidate for also being a fraud, but those are two fraud teams that played soft uh, schedules in the non-con, so who knows what to make of that. K-State beats UCF. We don't know what to make of that either. Tech wins at Texas. And then uh, number one fraud currently, BYU, lost by 11 at home to Cincinnati last night. So what sticks out to you guys from the Big 12 day number one? Uh, Houston winning by 34 to open power conference basketball for them since their Southwest Conference days anyway was pretty impressive. Um the Tech win, they jumped 17 spots in Ken Palm, just as we did. And then Cincinnati's win at BYU, they jumped 12th, or not in Ken Palm, in the net. Since they jumped 12 spots in the net. So those those are significant. I do think, you know, the Oklahoma-Iowa State game is interesting. Oklahoma is now 13-1 and one and, and uh, ranked really highly top 20 in the net, so or top 30 in the net. So they've had a significant non-conference. they got a couple decent wins. Um Surprising to me, I don't, you know, I don't even know. It's, I've got to go look as we start play. I've got to go back and look who the players are for each team because <laughs> it's such a, the the portal era. Everybody's got new guys, and it's so weird to to look at that. So, those were my five got five teams that I thought had the biggest wins yesterday in opening Big Twelve play. Uh, I mean, my probably biggest two takeaways. Number one, I unfortunately had to listen to Brian Heaney. On the way to Manhattan, that's a fun thing. Don't don't that that is a that is another fun thing that <laughs> uh, embrace that too, Ku fans. Embrace that you have such an unlikable and not fun listen on your radio team. That makes it fun for me to listen. I like I get I laugh every time. I I never go away from listening to a Ku radio broadcast where I don't have something that I can text to somebody or like laugh at or go, oh my gosh, these guys. I I can't turn this off. I love listening to KU radio broadcasts, so they should also not get upset about that either. They Honestly, they have the perfect hometown radio team. They are going to stroke your ego <laughs> if you're a KU fan and feed into everything that you believe, right or wrong. And if you are an opposing fan, you are going to go, these guys are idiots and they suck just like their fans. <laughs> this is all one giant compliment to KU, and they these people just don't get it. They are too soft. KU fans, for as successful and awesome as they are at basketball, and they have a lot of good things going for them other than just being crappy people that I tend to not like, they they are very, very soft. They are they get caught up in their feels far too much. And I'm aware that K-State has a very strong segment of their fan base that is like that as well, but I'm just, you know, pointing it out. It, I mean, it sounded like Hunter Dickinson got, like, stabbed in the middle of the floor. <laughs> Like they were like appalled about the play. And as soon as I pull into the parking lot at Bramlage, I'm like, okay, I got to see this. Like they were saying like Ernest Uday, like hit him on purpose because they recruited over him with Dickinson. And I, and the whole time in my head, I'm like, what the hell are you saying? Like he's so because you recruited Hunter Dickinson over him, he's going to purposely lose TCU the game. Mm -hmm. Like where's the logic in that? But that, that whole thing was a doozy to listen to. I'm sad that you missed it, Mason. Yeah, no, it was. Uh, it's all right. I mean, I, I, I was honestly with him yesterday. I thought it was an appalling act by Ernest Uday <laughs> as a guy that when KU was a uh, almost plus two hundred money line at home to TCU uh, late. I look. I, I thought that Ernest Uday probably should have been put in prison momentarily <laughs> for that act. And honestly, two free throws on the ball wasn't enough. I thought Hunter Dickinson should have gotten to shoot six free throws <laughs> yesterday. Uh, but it worked out. It worked out in the end. Uh, so hey, financial well, advice to anybody out there, uh, even though I'm not qualified to give it, anytime you see KU in a close game at home, just whatever money you have saved, find it and throw it into a, uh, a sports betting account and put it on the Jayhawks money line because it never fails. That is a, that was a nice payday yesterday. Yeah, I think I think it was my guy Rothstein that tweeted out KU is thirty six and six in five point games or overtime games in Allen Fieldhouse yes. in the Bill Self era. I can't believe that they I lost. I mean, everybody six of them. wins. Everybody wins those games eighty six percent of the time. That's yeah. everybody. Yeah, uh, uh, I also thought it was funny. Somebody was talking about that yesterday. 
And I was like, yeah, I guess I guess Bill Self hadn't built up enough cachet yet when Jim Waldridge was there to get that kind of help. Uh, <laughs> that might have been the last year that Bill Self wasn't getting those calls to help out. Well, while we're on a financial advice, I'd like, I'd like to give a personal shout out to Jalen Bridges for dunking the ball at the end of the Baylor game <laughs> for no reason at all to cover. <laughs> Yeah, uh, he, I, might, I, he, he might be in a support group with Iowa State football players <laughs> after this season if we review the, the inner workings of that dunk. No, I, I think that he should be celebrated for it. That was a great dunk. Yeah, uh, the Bears closed minus four and a half for anybody worried about that on the uh, betting side of it. Uh, I like I think that obviously uh, props to TCU for showing up yesterday and I mean, basically proving that last year was not a fluke when they went to Allen and won. Um, they did just have to pay the the reparations of they did actually win that game last year. And according to the basketball gods, you're not supposed to win those games in Allen. So, uh, or at least it's not supposed to be that easy. So they had to make it painfully hard for them to lose this year. And I look around right now. I mean, Houston is probably the one that stands out the most just because, yeah, West Virginia is terrible, but to make that kind of a statement, like I, I, Houston is highly motivated to prove that they belong in the Big 12 and that they can be a perennial contender to Kansas's claim at the top. Uh, I don't think that they will be, but to come out and do what they did yesterday proved that they were the real deal. And really, I look around and I, I see KU and Houston. Those are the only two legit teams right now in the Big 12. Um, everybody else is pretty resemblant of what college basketball as a whole is this year, which is not really a great product. <laughs> I mean, Purdue is head and shoulders, literally and figuratively, with Zach Eady above everybody else. But as I've tried telling people, I don't care about Purdue, and I'm not going to put any stock into what they do because of how bad Matt Painter has been in the NCAA tournament. It doesn't matter to me. So you can tell me how much better Purdue is. Yep, statistically and eye test-wise, they are right now. It means zero at this point and I think in the Big 12 what we're seeing is it's going to be a fun 18 game race we know it's going to come down to Kansas and Houston and maybe Baylor at the end of it but everybody that shuffles in basically spots four through 14 is going to be fascinating to watch and it's open to any one of these teams in the league except for probably West Virginia probably too big of a hole right now uh, to work themselves into the NCAA tournament yeah and UCF because they just suck so um, they, they're not going to be able to work themselves into anything other than maybe trying to get back to the American because they weren't even good in that. And <laughs> that's a bad start when you're looking at K state and you probably think you're so in, like, they're not playing that great. Um, and then they smash you by 30 and now you have to go home and face KU so bad. Also, I want to know what UCF booster or, you know, university member, was paying the the broadcast crew yesterday to try and claim that there would be 10,000 people in their arena for when KU plays there on Wednesday. Unless they're wearing blue and crimson and <laughs> KU fans just wanted a vacation from the snowstorm that we're about to get, there will not be 10,000 people watching a UCF basketball game in person. There will be 3,500 <laughs> at best. So that was the most asinine thing I heard on a college basketball game yesterday because they get nobody there. That It's going to be terrible. Speaking of not getting fans, uh, listen to Wichita State lose to North Texas in the middle of the week on uh, my way home from uh, – where was I? Oh, I think I had to go pick up like a prescription or something. Um, let me tell you, those <laughs> – the that game in Coke Arena, it sounded – maybe as good as a high school crowd on radio, but I'm going to guess that the Manhattan Junction City crowd on Friday night was louder than what Wichita State had cooking against North Texas. So uh, those are, of course, all the me playing the hits of the shots that I got to get in on all the people that I hate. So uh, any any other thoughts before we close this thing out today? I, I, you know, we talked about it before, but this is an opportunity for K-State with these next two games to – get a pair of road wins and give themselves a chance to, to, to start off big 12 play really well with Baylor and Oklahoma state coming in to the, to Bramlage after that. So good chance to get off to a good start. You, 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 you got a favorable schedule uh, c considering who you have to play. So I think K-State needs to go take advantage of it um, and improve to a lot of us that had questions um, going into big 12 play about what this team could be. Um, and and prove to themselves. And I think 
you know, the defense is going to be the key, but can they quit, keep making shots and can they go on the road and make shots? So that'll be something I want to watch. Drew, anything to add uh, in closing here? I mean, that, that was just about everything that I had, but yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll say that, uh, I mean, it's, it, it's, in, we're going to figure out a lot about this team over this next week. Cause I think that you need to take at least one of these two games. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I really do think that, I mean, you're looking at it right now with the way things are set up, like this is a gettable stretch and a team that is, is tournament worthy. They, they find a way to win the game in Morgantown and, and they'll get uh, some other ones. And obviously you can make a really significant impression if you find a way to, uh, take down Texas tech too, and then come home. I, I don't expect you to beat Baylor, but then it's, <laughs> excuse me, the coach got you up to me now, uh, Oklahoma <laughs> state who is also gettable. So you have, <clears throat> this is so bad. I was going to try and work through it. I thought I could do it, but you have a stretch here of five games where you could theoretically be four and one. And that gives you a pretty massive leg up with the final 13, 13 games that you need, or even that one game in Kansas City that you could possibly get as a win, which we know that the conference tournament isn't as impactful to the tournament case anymore. But if you get a decent enough one when you're on the edge there in Kansas City, it probably helps you out. All right. That sounds good. Good place to end it. Uh, I was going to try and see if one of you want to help me out and say one more thing so I can get a drink of water in, but it's all right. <laughs> We're going to get through it. We don't need it. For Drew Galloway, KSU underscore fan, uh, I'm Mason Both. I'm not contagious anymore, but I may still sound like crap uh, every once in a while after uh, my my <laughs> my bout with COVID just to, just to watch Avery Johnson and K-State win a, a Pop-Tarts Bowl. Uh, it was worth it, though. It was worth it. It was worth it. And fan didn't get sick nope. miraculously, so – that's a big no difference. Okay. Well, we got through it. Uh, long show today. Didn't anticipate going this long, but K-State basketball, a lot more fun to talk about after just one game to change the momentum and everything than what we experienced the last couple of weeks. So we are out of here. This same trio, we are back next Sunday. We'll have two more K-State games in the books, both of them on the road at West Virginia at Texas Tech. D.Y. and I will have stuff throughout the week. So, uh, if you want more than just the video stuff and you only are getting it here, make sure you go to kstateonline.com over at On3 for all the great written work. Uh, a lot of football recruiting stuff going on right now. Transfer portal. Guys, K-State working hard on some receivers. Uh, also some some good uh, notes from everywhere else around K-State. So that's where you can get it, K-State Online. Thanks for watching. We'll be back next week.